Right, good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. N. Edward Duran, and uh, welcome to Fertility 101 in Atlanta, Georgia at Pathways Fertility. A um, few housekeeping uh, issues. Uh, if you have questions, please um, write them in the question answer section. Uh, not in the chat, and I will address the questions at the end. A um, little bit about myself. Uh, I grew up here in Atlanta, Georgia. I was born in uh, Argentina and moved to the United States when I was uh, five years old. Went to Woodward Academy, uh, University of Georgia, the Medical College of Georgia, and then did my residency uh, at William Beaumont Hospital in Michigan and fellowship in reproductive endocrinology was at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, both my mother and father were physicians here in Atlanta. They had five boys and four of us became doctors, two OBGYNs. I'm the fertility specialist. I have one brother that's a vascular surgeon as well. And I specialize in fertility treatment, uh, diagnosis and treatment and uh, reproductive robotic surgery. So the objectives of today's webinar are to um, discuss how to select a fertility specialist to understand that um, OBGYNs will do basic fertility workups and uh, early treatment. But for specialized treatment, it is uh, necessary to see a reproductive endocrinologist that's fellowship trained and has access to all the technology available, uh, including insemination um, and in vitro fertilization. Uh, we're gonna talk about the treatments that are appropriate and most effective. Uh, we'll talk about the success rates and how they've evolved uh, over the years. I've been doing IVF for 27 years and I've seen uh, tremendous uh, progress in success rates. Uh, we will touch on recurrent miscarriage and unexplained infertility. Uh, we'll talk about new techniques in fertility that have uh, dramatically increased success rates, including uh, robotic surgery. So the, uh, the prevalence of infertility is uh, something that um, we're going to review as well as the evaluation uh, as the uh, typical treatments, which include often insemination uh, or in vitro fertilization. And then we'll talk about uh, genetic testing of embryos. So fertility is defined as um, 12 months of trying to conceive with normal periods for couples under the age of 35. Uh, for patients over 35, uh, if there's six months of regular periods without uh, conception, uh, we recommend that they see a fertility specialist. Uh, over the age of 40, uh, we think it's important to go see a fertility specialist uh, right away when you uh, want to try to conceive and are having difficulty. The causes of infertility are divided about one third are male factor, uh, one third are female factors that can often include ovulation dysfunction, endometriosis, and uh, blocked fallopian tubes, and uh, then there are couples where it's a combination of factors. You may have um, a low sperm count or low sperm uh, morphology in addition to uh, lack of ovulation or endometriosis. So the hormone interactions, um, the hypothalamus in the brain is what produces the gonadotropin releasing hormone that stimulates the pituitary to release the FSH, which stands for follicle stimulating hormone. And that's what causes the uh, eggs in the ovaries to grow. The LH is a called luteinizing hormone and that's the hormone that uh, releases the egg. So you may have heard of ovulation predictor kits where you test urine to detect ovulation. Uh, they're actually testing the LH because patients have an LH surge before they ovulate and the ovary feeds back both to the hypothalamus and the pituitary uh, estrogen, which uh, drives the signal to uh, cause the follicles to grow and to cause ovulation. So you first want to document ovulation and you can do that uh, by taking a menstrual history, by measuring a uh, progesterone 
level in the luteal phase. Um, we also look at ovarian reserve by doing testing on day three of the menstrual cycle where we test for FSH and estrogen and that gives us an idea of the overall ovarian reserve. We also now are using an AMH or anti-mullerian hormone blood test to look at ovarian reserve. And the important thing about this hormone, instead of being produced in the pituitary like FSH, it's produced in the uh, ovaries themselves and it can be measured at any uh, time in the cycle. It can be measured even while patients are on birth control pills. Um, so it's an overall view of the ovarian reserve. It's an important concept with AMH is that it is a predictor of how many eggs you would produce in a conventional IVF cycle, but it does not say anything about egg quality. So egg quality is most closely correlated to the patient's age, while the AMH um, will tell us how many eggs you may produce, but not anything about quality. So as you may know, um, women are born with all the eggs that they're gonna have. And you can see this number uh, decreases dramatically. So you start off with about six to 7 million. Um, and then it drops down to around 350,000 um, by birth and then 200,000 when you have um, your first period. Uh, of note, uh, in a reproductive lifespan, a woman will ovulate about 400 eggs. So the vast majority of the eggs undergo programmed cell death or apoptosis. And here we see schematically how this occurs. So there's lots of follicles that are recruited every month and typically only one will ovulate. All the other ones will undergo atresia or programmed cell death. So this is an important concept where women that donate eggs, uh, they're not gonna run out of eggs because they donated eggs three or four times while they were younger. Um, losing an ovary is also not going to accelerate your path to menopause. So there's more eggs than you'll ever uh, need and it's just a matter of uh, seeing what happens as they uh, progress. So what we wanna also do in addition to testing for uh, ovarian reserve and ovulation status, we wanna look at the tuple status and this is examined with a hysteroseptingogram or an HSG. And this is an X-ray where we inject a dye into the cervix and you can see on the left side of your screen, this is a normal um, test where the outline of the uterus is normal and you can see the thin path of the dye going through the fallopian tubes on both sides. And then you can see the fimbrial folds here and it's normal. And since the patient is laying on her back on the x-ray table, you can see the dye just spreading out throughout the pelvis and this is a completely normal study. Um, to contrast that on the right, we see that the tube fills up with dye and it fills up like a sausage. The dye is confined to both tubes and does not spill. This is called the hydrosalpinx. And when this happens, the fluid that accumulates in the tube is toxic to the embryos and it has nowhere to drain other than back into the uterus. So it's important for patients that have hydrosalpinges, um, they may already know that their tubes are blocked and they need to do IVF, but doing IVF with the hydrosalpinx in place dramatically reduces the success of IVF because the fluid, like acid rain, uh, is draining into the uterus and will um, cause the IVF to be unsuccessful and it will uh, damage the embryos. So the important thing when you do have hydrosalpinges, it's important to do laparoscopy surgery and actually remove or disconnect the tube from the uterus. Um, my recommendation is to remove the tube. It has no positive function and it's not necessary to have a baby. You just need a uterus that's healthy and ovaries with eggs, okay? Um, <clears throat> this is another important evaluation and it's called hysteroscopy. It's the way we evaluate the uterine cavity uh, for patients uh, that have infertility. So 
Here we see patients that have fibroids. There's a polyp, could be a septum. A septum is associated with recurrent miscarriage. And this is a simple procedure done in the office. It does not require anesthesia. It can usually be performed in two or three minutes and uh, is both diagnostic and therapeutic. So endometriosis occurs in about 14% of reproductive age women, but it occurs in approximately 60 to 70% of patients that have infertility. So this is an important uh, study that was performed by Dr. Uh, Cameron Najat at Stanford University um, many years ago, but it tells us that the, there is a collection of 600, or I'm sorry, um, 64 patients that had undergone two previous IVF cycles that had failed. None of the patients had had laparoscopy before, so the patients were divided into two groups. One group had the surgery performed by Dr. Najat, and that's the laparoscopy group here. And then the other group of 35 patients did not have the laparoscopy. Of note, what we can see is that when the patients were monitored for two years after the surgery, the pregnancy rate was significantly higher in patients that had the laparoscopy. And it should be noted that when the laparoscopy was performed, approximately 60 to 70% of the patients had stage three or greater endometriosis. So that was the cause why the IVF was unsuccessful. Uh, and you can see that what's even more astounding that half of the patients or more than half of the patients that conceived after the surgery did so with no future fertility treatment. So it wasn't that they required insemination or IVF to achieve their pregnancy. Um, they had failed two prior IVF cycles, they had surgery, and then you know, two or three months later, they conceived naturally. So that's an important concept that you know, fertility doctors nowadays tend to do less surgery than before. Um, I've always been a big proponent of having a reproductive surgery program as part of your fertility practice so that you can uh, enhance the success rate of everything you do, whether it be insemination, IVF, or spontaneous pregnancies. And since 2006, I've been performing the majority of my surgeries robotically, which is a much more precise way of uh, performing surgery where you can remove endometriomas or chocolate cysts, you can remove fibroids, you can um, re reconnect uh, fallopian tubes that have been tied, uh, you can remove hydrosalpinges, and it's uh, minimally invasive. Patients go home the same day, they recover in one week, they have less risk of infection, blood loss, and uh, scar tissue formation compared to open surgery. So for the male infertility, we do a semen analysis. So you see we want to have a normal volume concentration motility, and most importantly, the morphology is the shape of the sperm, and that correlates to the fertilization rate. So here on the left, you can see a normally shaped sperm with a normal head, midpiece, and tail. And then these are all the abnormal shapes. Remarkably, what's considered a normal morphology in the semen analysis is just 4% of the sperm have to have a normal shape. Um, so even 90, you know, you can have 96% of the sperm have these abnormal shapes and it would still be considered a normal semen analysis. For ovulation, what we do is we um, check hormone levels. If someone doesn't ovulate, we can check a thyroid and prolactin. They can sometimes uh, be the cause of that. For men, we check the semen analysis and then we do the ovarian reserve testing for women. And that's particularly important for women over the age of 35. So fertility treatments are basically divided into two categories. So one category consists of intrauterine insemination with ovulation induction. So this works well for patients that have PCOS or polycystic ovarian syndrome and don't ovulate, or for uh, same-sex female couples that want to come in and use donor sperm IUI. 
Um, we stopped several years ago using injectable fertility drugs with IUI because of the lack of control over higher order multiple pregnancies that would be triplets or beyond. So typically we use either Clomid or Letrozole as the oral agent uh, combined with insemination. If the patient doesn't ovulate, then sometimes they'll even uh, consider natural uh, intercourse. For IVF, the goal there is to stimulate the ovaries to grow multiple eggs and then retrieve the eggs, take them to the laboratory to create embryos, and then in a separate cycle, do a transfer to uh, transfer the embryo. So for IUI, um, we wash, we collect and wash the sperm, and then with a speculum exam, just like a pap smear, we place a thin catheter in the uterus and deposit the sperm. The success rate is approximately 15 to 20%, and it's uh, often accompanied by giving fertility medications. The risk of multiple pregnancy if we use Clomid or uh, Letrosol is usually 8% or less. For IVF, we stimulate the ovaries to grow eggs. We retrieve them with an ultrasound guided needle aspiration. And this can be done under um, propofol anesthesia or in some cases with patients that don't have a lot of follicles, it can uh, be done without anesthesia. We collect the eggs, create the embryos, and then in a separate cycle is when we do the transfer. And we're gonna talk about how separating the retrieval from the transfer can enhance success rates. So this is the intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So you can see uh, a sperm is being retrieved and then injected directly into the egg. Um, and this enhances fertilization. You can see the shell around the egg is called the zona pellucida. And importantly, that gets thick with time and more resistant to natural fertilization. That's why patients over 35 that are doing IVF uh, often will use the ICSI procedure. So this is the timeline. So we start off with an egg, which is the largest cell in the body. We inject the sperm into the egg, and then we produce a zygote. So this is a zygote on day one, and then it goes to the clevis stage. So this would be day two, where we have two to four cell embryos. An A cell embryo is on day three, and then it forms a blastocyst, typically between day five and day seven. The blastocyst stage is when we do the embryo uh, biopsy, and we're going to discuss that in a minute. So for male factor infertility, if you do no treatment at all, it's a very low success rate, only about one to 4% uh, percent per month. IUI does not improve that uh, significantly, uh, nor does Clomid with IUI. So we can see that the success rate is under 10% for all these categories here. You really need to do that direct sperm injection to in, uh, improve fertilization rates. With unexplained infertility, we see similar results where we have relatively low rates with IUI uh, or no treatment, but when we do IVF and directly inject the sperm into the egg, uh, we have results that are 50%. So what can be done to improve pregnancy rates? Well, let's talk about the different um, IVF uh, protocols that are available. So, when IVF started in 1978 in England and 1981 in the United States, it was done with natural cycle. We did not have the injectable fertility drugs at that point, and it took hundreds and hundreds of cycles for them to have a successful outcome. Now, um, what's happened is in the early 80s, injectable fertility drugs were created, and because our success rates were so low, we thought that logically we just need to make more eggs and that's going to improve success. Um, and what we've seen, you know, back in 1994, when I started doing IVF, we would routinely uh, retrieve 30 to 50 eggs. We would transfer four to six embryos and have a 14% success rate. But the embryologist back then knew that the egg quality was poor and the embryo quality was poor when you retrieve so many eggs. So that's when we started to look at other ways of stimulating the ovaries and producing better outcomes. So to summarize with conventional IVF, 
patients often use birth control pills uh, for several weeks to control their cycle and adjust it. Uh, they may use Lupron, which will turn off the signal from the pituitary to the ovary, and then start to inject high doses of injectable um, follicle stimulating hormone to stimulate the ovaries to grow eggs. Uh, and then, you know, at the end, you're retrieving multiple eggs and transferring at that stage. With natural cycle IVF, uh, the goal there is not to use any medication at all. Um, we get fewer eggs, but we get higher quality. So this is something where um, it would be effective. And here we can see a schematic of conventional compared to natural cycle. And the patients that are candidates for that would be you know, young patients that have uh, tubal disease, like ectopic pregnancy history. You have male factor where you need to inject sperm into the egg. You have a history of hormone sensitive cancers like uh, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. Um, remarkably, if you have diminished ovarian reserve, if you have a very high FSH, injecting FSH in the form of fertility drugs is not going to increase success rates and it's not going to recruit more eggs. So patients often will do better um, with natural cycle if they have a high FSH. Patients that have diminished ovarian reserve or over the age of 42 as well will do better. With mini stem IVF, it's kind of that perfect sweet spot between conventional IVF where you're producing 20 or 30 eggs and uh, natural IVF where you're producing one to two eggs. So on average, we'll get six to eight high quality eggs. And to do this, we use a combination of oral medication like Clomid and Leprosol, and then use fewer injections. Uh, it's safer. There's no risk of ovarian hyperstimulation. It can often be done without anesthesia. So this shows the schematic of how the mini stem IVF starts with oral medication and then adds the injectable medications later. So one uh, issue to understand is that when you use the oral agents like Clomid starting on the second or third day, what you're doing is you're naturally recruiting eggs uh, because your brain is, is giving all the FSH to the ovaries to recruit the eggs. We think that by your body recruiting the eggs, that's how we end up with better quality eggs and we're not using supraphysiologic levels of FSH in the form of injections. The difference with conventional IVF is that on the third day of, of your stimulation is when you start to give uh, supraphysiologic levels of uh, FSH, and therefore you may be recruiting eggs that were not destined to be quality eggs and produce quality embryos. So the candidates for mini stem IVF, obviously women that don't want to use a lot of medication, um, patients with normal ovarian reserve, um, patients that want to avoid hyperstimulation, even patients that have polycystic ovarian syndrome are good candidates. And we see quite a few patients that have failed conventional IVF. So if you're doing conventional IVF and you're um, getting poor quality embryos, uh, one thing to consider is with mini stem IVF, that changes the way you recruit the eggs, and often you will end up with better quality embryos. So, this shows um, the embryo biopsy um, that we do on day five to seven. And the goal there is to remove some of the uh, trophectoderm, which gives us the genetic uh, makeup of the embryo. By doing so, we're able to determine if the embryo is male or female, uh, genetically normal or abnormal. Once we get the biopsy, we freeze the embryo. And this is one of the changes that have happened over the last um, 30 years is now that we're using vitrification, it's a different technique of freezing. Um, as you know, embryos are made of mostly water so the old technique of freezing was called slow freeze, and it would be the equivalent of filling a glass bottle with water, sealing it, and placing it in your freezer. As the water freezes, it expands and would damage the embryo and damage the mitotic spindle. Um, with vitrification, the way to think about it is think of your embryo as a grape, 
And what we do is we pass the embryo through culture media that will draw out the water from the embryo and essentially turn it into a raisin. Then we freeze the raisin and now there's no damage to the embryo because the fluid has been removed from the embryo. Once we thaw the embryo, we place it back through a series of culture media that will re-expand the embryo and we get virtually 100% survival. So that's allowed us to separate the retrieval of the eggs and creation of the embryos from the embryo transfer. So embryo transfers, and it may sound counterintuitive, that they're actually more successful when you do a frozen embryo transfer than when you do a fresh embryo transfer. This is data from Life IVF Center where I practiced for the last seven years before coming to Pathways. And what it does illustrate is that once you do the genetic test and you have a normal embryo, it doesn't matter if you're less than 34 or above 43, the likelihood of success is between 70 and 80%. So the challenge is in patients over 40 is to find that normal embryo. But once you get a normal embryo, the success rate is the same. This is a collection of 6,400 embryo biopsies, and it shows in the green the percentage of normal embryos, and in the black, the percentage of abnormal embryos. And what we can see is that starting around age 35, there's a dramatic increase in the percentage of abnormal embryos compared to normal embryos. And this uh, shows the breakdown of the sample size on the left by age. So in the green, what you can see is when your success rate uh, or when the likelihood of uh, obtaining a genetically normal embryo is over 50%. So you can see for someone that's 42 plus, they're gonna have a 15 to 20% chance that one embryo is normal. So they may have to bank up to five embryos in order to find that normal embryo. So this introduces the concept of embryo banking, which is combining cycles where you may get one or two embryos one cycle, and then you come back and do more the second or third cycle. And this is what we see in patients that are uh, particularly over 40 that may have to do. <clears throat> the concept of testing the embryos right now in our practice, uh, the vast majority of our patients are having embryo testing. And the concept there is that to test three embryos, so this is the cost of IVF at our center, 8150, to test three embryos cost $1,800. And um, it's important to understand that the embryos all look the same. So if you don't do the test and you have, in this case, two abnormal embryos and one normal, the likelihood is that you're gonna pick an abnormal embryo transfer that embryo and the patient will likely either not conceive or have an early miscarriage. Yes, she'll still have two remaining frozen embryos, but at that point, she'll have to come back and do a separate frozen embryo transfer cycle, which costs twice as much uh, compared to what it would have cost to test the embryos initially. So it makes more sense knowing that your success rate is gonna be between 70 and 80% if you transfer a normal embryo, to go ahead and do the genetic testing on the front side so that you don't have to come back and pay for a separate embryo transfer. And with the embryo banking, this shows how um, it can be bundled into one, two or three cycle packages, which lowers the cost uh, so there's a cost savings. So if someone comes into the office and is 43 years old and she understands that based on statistics that she'll likely need two or three cycles to achieve a genetically normal embryo with genetic testing, then um, cost savings can be obtained through that. So to summarize, um, for female infertility, if you have ovulation dysfunction, you can often uh, treat that so if you have PCOS, you can treat that with um, ovulation induction with oral medication. If you have tubal factor endometriosis, often uh, IVF will be necessary. For male factor, um, we typically recommend IVF if it's a severe male factor. Uh, for mild male factor, they could try IUI. 
For unexplained infertility, patients often will start with IUI, and if it's initially unsuccessful, will progress to IVF with ICSI. So um, I'm, thank you for your attention. Uh, I'm happy to entertain questions uh, from the group. Um, so we're gonna start off. Uh, my partner and I have been trying for a year. Uh, is it important to get an infertility evaluation now or should we wait longer? So, uh, so certainly, um, it makes sense to be evaluated. So you wanna look at ovulation, fallopian tubes with an HSG and the dye test. And remember over the age of 35 with normal periods, we recommend that you seek treatment uh, or evaluation after six months. Uh, we have another question. Uh, we easily conceive with baby number one, but have been trying for over a year for baby number two. What is the reason for this? So part of it could be just the normal age-related fertility decline. Um, you had a C-section or complications with the pregnancy where you may have had to have a DNC. Sometimes there could be scarring in the uterus or in the pelvis where the fallopian tubes may not um, be in, in a position to pick up the egg if scar tissue formed after a C-section. Also, the, the evolution of endometriosis, many women in their 20s don't have endometriosis, but by 35, they may develop endometriosis. So um, there's a number of reasons why secondary infertility occurs, but it's, it is evaluated the same way. Um, next question, I've been on uh, birth control for over 12 years. Will this affect my for future fertility? So. Uh, birth control, whether it's pills or IUD or implants, um, does not affect future fertility. You're not going to diminish your egg number um, by using uh, birth control. Um, how does age affect fertility? So as we reviewed, um, the quantity and quality of eggs diminishes with age, and the um, shell around the egg becomes thicker and more resistant to penetration. Uh, so that's where the ICSI is needed. Um, what can I do uh, on my own health-wise to increase my fertility? Well, certainly um, recommend that you have a healthy BMI. So we, there is data showing that an elevated body weight uh, does reduce fertility and increase the risk of miscarriage. Uh, eating healthy, um, getting uh, plenty of rest and exercise, um, low stress, uh, and using supplements like DHEA and CoQ10 and antioxidants can also be beneficial. Um, next question. Uh, if we're having problems as a couple conceiving, uh, should you have your partner tested? So my recommendation is always to do the sperm test first because that's gonna guide treatment. If the sperm test shows that the sperm count is uh, very low or the morphology is abnormal and you know you're gonna need to do IVF with ICSI, then you may not even have to do the x-ray to look at the fallopian tubes uh, if you're not concerned about that. Um, I'm having trouble conceiving. Uh, do I have to automatically start with IVF? So you don't have to automatically start with IVF. Um, We've seen over the years that more patients are doing IVF compared to IUI because of the success rate differences. So several things have happened over the last 30 years. So IVF success rates have dramatically improved while ovulation induction and IUI rates have remained the same. And the cost of IVF has dramatically decreased. So when I started doing IVF in 1994, it was $10,000 a cycle with no medication. If you calculate that for inflation today, that would be $17,800. In our center, it's $8,150. Um, what is the first step to seeing a fertility doctor? So the first step is to set up a um, in-person consult or a virtual consult. Uh, it can be done on the phone uh, or via Zoom. Uh, or in person, but um, you do not have to be referred by an OBGYN uh, to see a fertility specialist. Uh, you can call up and make a, an appointment yourself. Uh, we're gonna see if we have any additional questions. 
Okay. So we have a question. I've been diagnosed with being infertile. My AMH is 0 0.03, and I turned 40 last month. Uh, we found your site looking into many IVF options. During today's presentation, would you please touch on the procedure and the success rate for someone like me? So like we reviewed, um, a low AMH is associated with a low number of eggs being produced, but low number of eggs does not mean uh, poor quality eggs. So the advantage of minimal stimulation IVF is that you're gonna uh, enhance the quality of the eggs. So we've had patients, we had one that was 41 years old and with mini IVF, she did less than average. She only produced two eggs. Of those two eggs, one fertilized, but we tested that embryo and it was genetically normal. For, so for her, she defied the odds because of the stimulation protocol and she made a genetically normal embryo with only one. Um, so once you, the, the success rate really is tied to whether or not you have a genetically normal embryo. The big quest is finding that genetically normal embryo. Once you have that, then the success rate will be between 70 and 80%, even at age 40. Um, next question. We've both taken the COVID vaccine. Will that adversely affect our treatment? No. So we do recommend that all our patients, uh, whether they're in cycle or in treatment, uh, have the COVID vaccine. If anything, uh, conceiving, uh, when you're unvaccinated um, and you do get sick with COVID, um, the morbidity and the, the, the degree of illness, if you're already pregnant when you uh, get COVID is much worse than if you're not pregnant. So the recommendation is whether you're trying to conceive or, or even in early pregnancy to go ahead and get vaccinated. And the advantage there is that it's been shown that the vaccine is transmitted to the baby and the baby is born um, essentially vaccinated. Uh, I'm for, 44 with a high FSH. Is it better to try natural or mini? So um, my criteria for uh, trying natural or mini is the, how high the FSH is. So typically if the FSH is 20 or less, I will try many. If the FSH is uh, over 20, then that's where I will try natural cycle IVF. And we've had you know, patients that have had FSHs as high as 70 and 90 uh, achieve pregnancies with their own eggs by using a natural IVF technique. Um, we have another question. Um, wondering what we should be pursuing before I thought <clears throat> because I had a low AMH that mini IVF was the best option. But after hearing um, what you just said, that may not be the case. I am 40 with an FSH of 11.4, an LH of 11, a TSH of zero of 10 point, I'm sorry, a T4 of 10.8, a TSH of 0 0.8, an AMH of 0 0.03. Uh, we've tried Clomid, but eggs produced on the wrong side of my body, as I have a blocked fallopian tube on the left. We've tried Minipure, and my body didn't respond at all. We've been trying for more than a year, and with help, um, with help thinking we could do, uh, was hoping that we could do an IUI. Should we continue um, with our clinic with less than 1% uh, or, or see another doctor? So my recommendation at age 40 is that uh, you not do IUI, uh, especially if you have uh, a black fallopian tube. Um, so the fact that you didn't respond to Minipure maybe that if Minipure was initiated at the beginning of the cycle. So if you responded to Clomid, you know, typically with mini stem IVF, what we do is we start with the Clomid and that helps your body endogenously recruit the eggs. And then we introduce the FSH, which could be Gono, Gono F or uh, Fala stem with Minipure. 
the standard dose for mini stem IVF is relatively low. It's only one Clomid tablet a day, um, and then using 75 units of FSH and 75 units of Minipure. That compares to conventional IVF, where often 450 to 600 units of injectable gonadotropins are used every day. So sometimes if you start off with injectable medication at the very beginning of your cycle, um, the receptors will downregulate and you won't get any response. Let's see if we have more questions. Um, will IVF work if, if uh, one tube is blocked? So absolutely. And the important caveat there is that um, if it's blocked with a hydrosalpinx or uh, a dilated fallopian tube, that's where surgery may be necessary in advance. But um, if it has a proximal occlusion, then uh, IVF will work. Uh, we have another question. Uh, I am 41, only have one child by uh, self and, hub and hubby. Uh, want a child together, my oldest is 21. I was told there is no blockage, but I've been trying for four years, what, what should we do? So I do recommend that you see a fertility specialist. And at age 41, uh, I do recommend IVF. I think at, uh, at that age, injecting the sperm into the egg, especially after trying for four years, is going to be required to produce uh, a healthy pregnancy. Uh, I've had one failed IVF cycle in 2016 and uh, tried and canceled one in 2018. I am 42. Um, which treatment do you recommend? Sperm count is moderate, uh, normal volume, morphology moderate. So at 42, uh, my recommendation is for minimal stimulation IVF. Um, I've had many patients that have failed IVF and uh, with minimal stimulation IVF have been successful. Um, we have uh, had a successful IVF and have frozen embryos. We want to conceive again, but my age is now 40. Is the success rate comparable to what it was four years ago? Or do we, uh, we did not conduct genetic testing initially. So the success rate is locked in um, at the age in which the eggs are, are retrieved. So if you had IVF four years ago, so at 36, that's your success rate. We have had some patients that have thawed, frozen, untested embryos, biopsied them, and refroze them uh, with success. So we know at age 36 that about half of your embryos are going to be abnormal and half are going to be normal. So um, I think it's reasonable to use the embryos you have frozen, and you should anticipate that your success rate will be similar. Let's look. We got some more questions. Um, okay, my partner had a prostatectomy, uh, but we banked some some of his sperm. Is it a waste of time to do IUI? Should we do IVF? So um, my recommendation: it depends on how much sperm is banked. Um, ejaculated sperm can be used successfully for IUI. Uh, if sperm has to be obtained from the testicle, then uh, it needs to be used for IVF with ICSI. Um, so let's just say if you had three vials of sperm, you only need one vial of sperm for IVF, and it can be refrozen and aliquoted into small uh, amounts. So, you know, it certainly it depends how much sperm is frozen, but uh, you could try IUI with uh, Clomid or Letrosol. Uh, but I would only do one or two cycles and make sure you have sperm in reserve to do IVF if that's necessary. Keep in mind, IVF is going to be much more successful than IUI, and a lot depends on the age of the patient. So if, if you're over 35, then um, my recommendation would be to do uh, IVF with the direct sperm injection. Um, are the medications included in the in the price? So, the so they are not. The average cost of minimal stimulation IVF medication for one cycle is one thousand two hundred dollars. The average cost for 
uh, conventional IVF medication is in the range of four to six thousand uh, dollars. Could you explain again why egg quality is better with minimal stimulation IVF? So, what we see is that, and you know, I mean, this is something my embryologist told me twelve years ago. That I'm sorry. 27 years ago when I started doing IVF is that when you make a lot of eggs, the egg quality is negatively impacted. Um, and, you know, we've had patients that have done conventional IVF and, and then two months later they do many IVF. So they actually are serving as their own control. We can say, okay, with conventional IVF, you know, you may, 11 eggs and three embryos and they're all abnormal. So that's a, that's a testament to the quality of the egg and embryo. And then, you know, two months later, the patient does mini stem IVF and she makes you know, fewer eggs. Let's say she makes six eggs and those six eggs only produce two embryos. But if one or two of those embryos are genetically normal, then when you compare those two patients, you can say, well, you're, egg and embryo quality was better with mini stem IVF. And it's important to understand mini stem IVF is not just getting the dose of your fertility drug and cutting it in half or even cutting it into a quarter. It's the way the follicles are recruited that makes such a big impact on the quality of the eggs and embryos. So the first five days of the stimulation, there's no injections given at all. The patient is only using Clomid or Letrosol, so all the recruitment of the eggs is being done endogenously or internally by the patient's own pituitary. And then the growth is propelled by using low-dose injectable medications. You contrast that to conventional IVF, where you give supraphysiologic high doses of fertility injections of FSH on stimulation day one, and then therefore you're recruiting eggs that weren't destined to be healthy eggs or embryos. That's the contrast between the two. Let's see if we got some more questions here. Um, will IVF work with tubes being blocked? Does the toxic fluid build up um, and prevent it from being successful? So it depends on where the blockage is. If the blockage is at the tip of the tube where it joins the ovary, that's called a hydrosalpinx, and yes, that fluid is toxic. It drains into the uterus and will prevent uh, IVF from being successful. If you have blockage proximally, where the connection of the tube to the uterus is blocked, then at that point, the tube being blocked has no negative impact. You don't require surgery, and IVF should be successful with uh, the tube being blocked. Uh, I am 46. I've been diagnosed with high thyroid, fibroids, and PCOS. Uh, if I want to do infertility treatment, what is the average cost I should be expecting to pay? And what are the chances of becoming pregnant? So at 46, the odds of becoming pregnant are going to be low. They're going to be under 10% if you're using your own eggs. The oldest patient I've helped achieve a pregnancy using her own eggs she delivered her baby at uh, 48, she conceived at 47, but it took her three IVF cycles to collect the embryos and test. The fibroids have to be addressed, so I would evaluate the fibroids. If they're clinically significant, it may require robotic surgery to uh, improve the uterus so it can hold the pregnancy. PCOS has no negative impact, uh, it, you know, so we can help you uh, grow eggs. Uh, and the thyroid can be treated. But at 46, the big question is doing treatment with donor egg or trying treatment with your own eggs. The cost of IVF, what to expect to pay. Um, for one cycle of IVF, it's $8,150, $1,200 for medication, and $1,800 to do genetic testing of three embryos. Uh, but you would be a candidate to do the two or three cycle package um, based on your age. Uh, next question. Uh, I've had two ectopic pregnancies, one fallopian tube left after surgery. I was diagnosed with infertility in a blocked fallopian tube and will be 42 in two months. 
um, would I be a good candidate for minimal stimulation IVF? Yes. So you're an ideal candidate for mini stem IVF. I think we're getting more questions. I appreciate all the questions. I, this is a, a well attended webinar. And, uh, happy to see so many questions and so many participants. All right. Um, is there anything for males to help with sperm morphology mot motility before IVF or, or does it not matter? Well, if you're doing IVF with the ICSI, it's really not uh, a significant uh, issue if you're trying to do IUI. So if you're dealing with a mild male factor, then I do recommend uh, using L-carnitine, uh, using DHEA, using antioxidants. Uh, L-carnitine you can find as uh, under the trade name Proxeed, P-R-O-X-E-E-D, and uh, it's available over the counter. But uh, to answer your question, if you're gonna do IVF with ICSI, um, taking the supplements are fine, but uh, it's really not necessary. Um, what is your take on day three versus day five embryos? Do you allow freezing of embryos on day three, especially for those that are 40 years old plus? Um, I always prefer a blastocyst. I do not recommend uh, freezing day three embryos. Uh, we've abandoned biopsies of day three embryos over a decade ago. And um, I look at day three embryos like a Hail Mary. You're, you're trying to freeze or transfer embryos that you're really not sure how they're gonna do, but you're not confident that your lab can grow them to the blastocyst stage. So if you have a great lab that can have uh, efficient blastocyst formation, uh, you really shouldn't be transferring or freezing embryos on day three. It may make the patient feel better that she made it to the transfer, but ultimately you're not impacting success rates. Um, does your clinic offer financing? Uh, so we work, it's not internally offered through our clinic, but we work with a finance company that offers medical uh, procedure financing. Uh, does mini stem IVF work uh, with frozen eggs? Does Pathway offer egg freezing? Yes, so minimal stimulation IVF um, can be used to freeze eggs to preserve future fertility. Um, and we do do that in our practice. So um, I do recommend that if a woman is single and is concerned about uh, being able to conceive in the future, that egg freezing is a good way to essentially have an insurance policy for future fertility. Next question, I am uh, 42, my husband is 43. The last cycle resulted in nine eggs retrieved, but only one embryo that barely made it to freeze on day three. His last semen analysis showed everything is normal. Do you recommend a sperm DNA uh, fragmentation test to be done? Does Pathway do the test? Uh, we offer the test if it's requested. Uh, I do not recommend that. Um, if the, if the semen analysis is normal and you only had one embryo developed from nine eggs, it's probably an egg quality issue, especially at age 42. So you're an ideal candidate for minimal stimulation IVF to see if we can get better quality eggs. Because if you get better quality eggs, you're gonna get better quality embryos. But um, from what you've listed, I do not uh, recommend a DNA fragmentation test. Next question. Um, what causes the acidic fluid to stay trapped in the tube. So typically, when a hydrosalpinx forms, it's an inflammatory process. So it could be PID, it could be chlamydia, it could be gonorrhea. I've had patients where they ruptured an appendix in childhood and the pus from that ruptured appendix landed on the right fallopian tube and caused the tube to scar closed with toxic um, inflammatory cells inside of the tube. So uh, that is the nature of that fluid. Uh, our successful IVF was in 2016. Um, was our embryo frozen by vitrification? Uh, how many embryos are transferred during an FET for a 40-year-old? 
so um, typically, um, yes, uh, five years ago, we were using vitrification. It's very likely that vitrification was used for your, for your embryos. Um, in general, I recommend transferring one embryo at a time. Um, if the embryo is genetically tested, I insist on transferring one embryo. Uh, if it's not tested, I will consider transferring a maximum of two embryos. Um, keep in mind that when, when you do IVF with ICSI and embryo biopsy, you increase the rate of identical twinning by tenfold. So in nature, uh, if you look at natural pregnancies, one in 300 natural pregnancies are identical twins. With IVF, um, the, the rate of identical twinning is three out of 100. So uh, just last month, I had two patients where one embryo split into two. Uh, and monozygotic twins are not like fraternal twins. It's a much more risky pregnancy uh, with risk of complications to one or both babies. So um, I still recommend transferring one if it's tested. Uh, if it's untested, you uh, may transfer two. Uh, hi, I am uh, 44. I've had four myomectomies, so that's fibroid surgery removals. Um, two bilateral ovarian cystectomies, so surgeries to remove cysts from the ovaries, and was recently diagnosed with endometriosis. I've never been pregnant. My husband's sperm count, motility, morphology are fine. I have a low ovarian reserve. I have pelvic adhesions from the numerous surgeries. What would you suggest uh, for me, please? Uh, been married for 13 years. So, um, well, I would suggest an evaluation. So, um, we can look at the ovaries by ultrasound, see if there's any antral follicles there. We can uh, measure AMH. We can look at FSH and estrogen. You may still be a candidate to do minimal stimulation IVF. Pelvic adhesive disease uh, does not affect our ability to retrieve eggs or do an embryo transfer. Certainly with your history of four fibroid surgeries, I would do the hysteroscopy to look inside the uterus and make sure it's healthy. Um, alternatively, there, you know, if there is no eggs to work with, uh, you may still be an excellent candidate for donor egg IVF. And that would mean just evaluating the uterine cavity, making sure it's healthy, and then using an egg donor with your husband's sperm to create an embryo. Uh, I think we have one more question. My husband is diabetic. Does this affect uh, fertility? Yes, it does. So men with diabetes have diminished blood flow uh, to the testicles that can uh, impact the spermatogenesis. So certainly I would do uh, a semen analysis uh, to make sure that's normal. But once you do that and it's normal, uh, certainly encourage him to keep the diabetes under control. And that can be monitored with a hemoglobin A1C blood test. Okay. Okay. We have one more question. Let's see. Um, and does type 2 diabetes affect female fertility? So um, diabetes, so there, to review, there's type 1 diabetes, which is um, what was often called juvenile diabetes and is insulin requiring. Type 2 diabetes is much more common. It's uh, often called insulin resistance and it's treated with metformin. Um, there is a higher correlation with the miscarriage risk with diabetes, but um, it's something where there's a correlation with um, not ovulating efficiently um, if you have uh, diabetes, but with treatment, with medication, you know, you would be a candidate for ovulation induction uh, with IUI or uh, depending on your age with IVF ICSI. Um, last question, what are the procedures you can do to evaluate the uterine cavity and make sure everything's good? So what I do in the office is the office hysteroscopy, which I showed during the webinar. It's a, it's a small fiber optic camera underwater to look in the uterus. It allows me to diagnose and treat issues inside of the uterus, and it's both diagnostic and therapeutic. I recommend that uh, 
far over and it's much more superior to either uh, an SIS or a saline infusion sonohistogram or an HI, uh, HSG or hysterosalpingogram. And certainly more informative than a FEMVIEW where you're injecting fluid and doing an ultrasound. Um, can medical insurance be used for IVF medication? Depends on your plan. Uh, there's mandate states where IVF coverage, including medication, is uh, mandated by the state legislature. Uh, Georgia is not one of those states, but it all depends on your employer. If you work for you know, Google or Apple or you know, Microsoft, you're likely going to have fertility coverage, including fertility medication. One of the advantages of minimal stimulation IVF is that um, the exorbitant cost of conventional stimulation IVF medication is not uh, part of the treatment. We're you know, doing uh, you know, $1,200 of medication. Um, so my assistant Caroline is gonna follow up with each of y'all um, to get your feedback, to um, offer ways where we could uh, connect in the future. And I very much thank you for your attention today and have a wonderful weekend.